So I think uh, all of you are uh, ex were expecting this sort of a presentation much earlier, but some delays happen always as, it, as we can see. So today's presentation, what I'm going to talk to you is about dwelling into the length scales from atoms to space. As you can see, a lot of view graphs, a lot of uh, videos which are running, there are different length scales what we can observe in our day-to-day -day activities. So let's go further beyond. As you can see in the video here, we are having different length scales in our day-to-day -day activities, ranging from the universe, which go further beyond into planets, into interstellar clouds, with varying different length scales, right from light years to kilometers, and further beyond, where we can see the distances among the planets to planets individually, and where we see our Earth, which is four times the dimension of the moon, and further, we see a beautiful lady sleeping in the park. Everything are different length scales. When we further try to go beyond, inside, you see much more things which are at different length scales from millimeters towards micrometers, then towards atomic level, where we see the nanometers and further picometers. All these things are various length scales, what we see in our regular day-to-day -day activities. On the right-hand side, you see a beautiful moon and beautiful sun with different diameters. Of course, all of these things are part and parcel of our life. When you look at the galaxies, so when you look at it from the Earth, when you look at it through a telescope which is placed in the sky, you have different views. All of them have their own beauties. So as you can see here, unraveling the secrets of these galaxies goes into different length scales. Right from my childhood, I've been always wondering about these things, looking at the stars, constellation of stars, what we used to see them, and also going through various geological trips along with my mom. I used to collect a lot of stones and try to understand what were happening at these levels even at a young age. And you know, through the happy moment that at Hyderabad we have a lot of national laboratories which are available for us where we can go and visit them. And uh, it all entered me into a new plethora of nanomaterials where I entered into the field of nanomaterials, the field of nanocomposites at my master's level. So what are these nanocomposites? Nanocomposites typically are a class of materials where we have different length, different uh, constituents. One primary constituent placed inside another constituent. So as you can see here, in this type of uh, typical con configuration, I worked on metal particles inside a matrix. The matrix can range from any type of polymers, oxides, glasses, or any type of uh, particles ranging from metal or oxide. So typically, I worked on metal titania and metal polymer-based composites varying applications ranging from batteries, medical sensors, electronic sensors, optics, antibacterial films. And depending on the arrangement of these particles at various length scales, and also the size and shape, the volume fraction, the amount of metal particles which are present inside the matrix, and the type of matrix, the properties were completely different. And we were also able to make them by using various methods of gas phase deposition, in addition to various other methods like, uh, you know, sputtering or uh, methods like uh, wet, wet deposition methods. So I typically worked on the optical properties of these materials and antibacterial properties of these materials. During the course of uh, all these uh, activity, uh, there were a lot of questions which were raised in literature from day-to-day -day activity, because literature survey is you know, most important part of any researcher's career. So one of the most important intriguing part is that nanoparticles, once they are kept inside a matrix, you can't change them. You need to change the properties sometimes, but once the particles are fixed, you need to do some other type of methodology. So there comes the whole idea where we try to do swift heavy ion irradiation. So swift heavy ions are some ions which are used to locally modify materials. So where are these swift heavy ions used now? Swift heavy ions are those ions which are 
typically used in the research of cosmic radiation because they form a major part of the cosmic radiation. In addition to that, they are used in a lot of tumor studies, surgeries for eyes, and so on. So I tried to use these things to modify these properties, create nanostructures locally within the film at different length scales again, and then based on which I was trying to get different properties, optical properties as well as antibacterial properties. So in the course of time, what happened was the properties, to study these properties, you need to know how the geometric arrangement of these particles are inside the material. So I had to go for an advanced method of electron microscopy. So learning this method with the group of Professor Kienle, it was a wonder. So I tried to study these things using electron tomography, a three-dimensional image technique inside electron microscopes, where we were able to see the particle size distribution and come to various conclusions or hypotheses, where we were able to see larger particles on the top surface, smaller particles within the matrix by using a variety of techniques of tomography, and we collected around 281 images, so, tilting the specimen holder and sample thereby minus 70 to plus 70 degrees and reconstructing the entire object. So what image or the video, whatever you see here, is a reconstructed image of 281 images, taking a lot of uh, effort for that time. But through this, I was able to establish this in that laboratory there. And further on, what intrigued me was basically what happens when I'm able to build some sort of energy materials or batteries by using these nanocomposites. So I started doing a lot of research, of research work in the field of energy materials, whether I can use the same silver titania based nanocomposites as electrodes and some other type of uh, polymer as uh, electrolyte and one more type of electrode where I can use them totally jointly. But then, the most important point which was intriguing all the researchers in the field was what happens at the interfaces. The interfaces are very, very small, few nanometers across. So most of the people were looking at what is happening at the interfaces, which led me to understanding how I can study these in nanoscale. So then I entered the field of in-situ transmission electron microscopy. So this field of in-situ electron microscopy is a beautiful field. So there's completely thinking out of the box because the methods at that time were to be established. So I started working at uh, one of the premier institutes in Germany in the field of battery materials, moving further on with, Prof with Professor Christian Kubel. And then the new generation battery materials which were very much interesting for the researchers at that time were the fluoride ion materials. So there were a lot of uh, work which was going on and this was the PhD work of one of my students where we tried to make these things specifically to study the interfaces, that is few nanometers which are across. And then we tried to lift out a lamella from this pellet what you see, typically a button cell what you call, compressed it for a different pressure where we can remove out a lamella by using a focused ion beam system and then thinning the interfaces which are very, 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 you know, critical to understand what happens across. And then you see here typically of the order of around 100 nanometers, we were able to thin them and then the whole lamella which is unusually large provides the mechanical strength for that. So then on the right hand side you see a scanning electron microscope image where the thinned regions were clearly evident. We tried to charge it inside the electron microscope and discharge it and see how the fluoride ions were moving throughout at the cathode electrolyte interface. And what happens also is some defects are formed which are few nanometers in uh, length and there were also some amorphous carbon which was formed, crystalline carbon was formed during the whole process and it was a study of its own, it was a PhD, PhD thesis of uh, Mr. Mohammed or Dr. Mohammed now. And then what happened is that it's not sufficient because the entire field requires much more depth. So barely looking at what is happening during the process is insufficient. So there were a lot of electrochemical reactions, degradations processes which were taking place during the whole process which needed to know or identify the local oxidation states, 
correlative effects which might result because of reaction with the electron beam, side reactions which might cause because of the fact that there is movement of ions, or propagation of the charging front. Of course, in influence of the interfaces, the grain boundaries also exist. Ion transfer also exists. And then exposure to air is one of the most important points. Whenever you open any battery, it completely burns off. All of them are sensitive to the air, right? Lithium ion batteries. The same way, we also have uh, fluoride ion batteries which are very sensitive to the air. So exposure to air contamination of the samples is very critical. So we had developed a special way in which we were able to do this. And then we also had uh, exposures to heavy doses of electrons because of the fact that we were looking through an electron microscope, how this could result during the process of preparation, during the process of imaging at various stages. And then there was also a lot of thinning which was happening by using uh, gallium ion beam and contacting of the lamella inside the scanning electron microscope, what you can see here, the lamella. All these things had a lot of effects which were resulting in the experiments. So these are if these, are, these effects are need to be still unraveled by the next generation. Although people say that lamella thickness variation doesn't have any effect, we need to still prove them. So layer thickness control is a very challenging aspect in this. Overall, multi-scale characterization, that is ranging from an SEM, from an X-ray diffraction equipment, or a transmission electron microscope at different length scales is very important, which unravels the entire history of battery during cycling. So in situ electron microscopy in combination with correlative electron microscopy or correlative methods of characterization becomes pivotal here. So in the whole course, there were a lot of uh, aspects related to characterization of materials, which led me come towards the most prestigious organization in India in the field of space sciences, which was also interested, interested in activities pertaining to the energy sector. So there comes the whole thing where I joined one of the premier organizations in the field of space sector, which works on various types of materials, ranging from launch vehicles towards satellites. So launch vehicles, as you know, are pivotal part of any, uh, any strategic application, especially not only in the country, but also globally. So when you see, current trends in uh, launch vehicle, people are going towards advanced technologies. And one of the most uh, intriguing aspect there is the field of manufacturing, which was going on in a higher level, where people started using advanced manufacturing or additive manufacturing, which I think most of you also would be studying here in their course. So the work started off by you studying a uh, lot of additively manufactured materials, how they perform at nanoscale because these nanoscale properties are actually determining the properties on the global scale for you. And then they were also studied by using transmission electron microscopy. We tried to study the precipitates, which are very critical, how they have depleted regions. They have sometimes oxygen present. Sometimes they have different types of oxides present, completely different from the conventional manufacturing routes. The strengths are sometimes superior. Sometimes they don't look so much well in terms of strength. Sometimes they fail. So understanding these things and catering to the needs of the launch vehicle sector was a very important aspect there. What also happens is that inside the country, we also try to do a lot of additional new work. So one, one such work is uh, hexagonal boron nitride silica composites, which were tried to be, which were tried at that time to be made indigenously for electric propulsion systems. So they tried to ind indigenously make them, but were never sure whether it was HBN and silica. And finally, we were able to understand that there was silica with boron nitride by using some elemental mapping techniques, one of its kind. And during the whole process, it was a huge plethora of uh, alloys and materials which normally we don't have in our regular books. These new series of alloys are, have been studied there and it was a fantastic uh, knowledge base which has developed from that aspect. And then comes the main point that during the whole process, there's a huge amount of work which is going on throughout the world in the field of aerospace materials. Not only towards studying it, 
but also studying it at applicational level. So once you see these are components like thrust chambers, piping systems, gas bottles, thermal conducting systems, and all of these part, uh, all, of, all of these things form a major part either from a launch vehicle upper stage or from a satellite's perspective. And these become critically important towards high profile space applications in the current scenario where the demand driven nature is driving the entire field. So this growth of all these fields towards advanced technologies, doing them faster, is also growing, leading to the growth of commercial grade and private entities in the space sector. Luckily, during the stay at this premier organization, uh, I had the opportunity to look into various things which were happening, especially in the Hyderabad area, where India's first privately built liquid engine was unveiled and successfully tested using monomethyl hydrazine and uh, nitrous oxide as propellants. And further on, going towards a cryogenic engine, which was also successfully 3D printed. Typically, a 3D printing of, typically 3D printing of such an engine would be much feasible when we know the properties. But at this level, where people trust on the literature, go with the com com complete characterization of these materials in a regular way, and get it out as a full-fledged product was something which motivates most of us here. So this uh, 3D printed engine typically took two days, while at other places of conventional manufacturing, it takes over six months to make such engines. These were regeneratively cooled, and the typical microstructure, what you can see in XYZ direction, what you can see here at different length scales. So with these things, the private company in India started making launch vehicles. As you see here, one suborbital class launch vehicle, which takes payloads to around 100 kilometers to orbit. The orbital class of launch vehicles, one which has three solid stages and an uppermost liquid stage, which is this one. And the two which contains three solid stages and an uppermost cryogenic engine on the top, which is supposedly this one. And three, which is a combination of three solid stages uppermost cryogenic engine and strap-on boosters on the side, leading to the fact that you have a change in the payload capacity according to the launch vehicle. So with these launch vehicles, a lot of work was going on and hopefully today we were, uh, we were uh, successful in making or testing some of these things uh, currently what, 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 what we are working on. So what you see here, Vikram 1, this launch vehicle is supposed to be launched towards the end of this year. In addition to that, we successfully launched the first suborbital mission, making history on 18th of November 2022. Making history on the 18th of November. The onboard camera view showing a beautiful glimpse of the entire coast, the dignitaries giving praises. And what we also notice is that the launch vehicle went into space, crossing the common line. Once the common line is crossed, it said that it went into space internationally. So this was a historic moment, mission praramb, and it led the whole thing into space. But my thirst of electron microscopy has not gone. It has been all the way there. So I am also a co-founder of one more company, which does uh, indigenously built products ranging from electron microscopy components, electron microscopy uh, accessories to electron microscopy holders, finally aiming towards electron microscopes as such. So as an example here, what you see are some of the grid boxes, which are one of its kind in the world, and some of the sample holders, like what you saw, a tomography holder, which can be tilted in different axes. So all these things are part and parcel of different length scales. So when we further go on to various length scales, we have seen length scales from atoms. We have, gain, we have seen length scales towards planetary systems. So the entire universe is made out of different length scales, but a combination of them is what I have seen throughout my entire journey. 
So it has been an intertwining journey ranging from material science and metallurgy towards space sciences where the length scales are ranging from nanometers to or picometers into the length scales of light years. So with the hope that this sort of a journey is interesting to most of you, I see that it's not any more one particular field which is necessary. It's a conglomeration or intertwining of various fields which are necessary for the next generation. So as you can see here, these are examples of some in-situ experiments which were conducted inside the microscope at various length scales where different grains during heating are changing, different uh, domain walls move because of their magnetic, mo magnetic motion, magnetic moment changes and the beautiful lunar eclipse which happened and the mission param on board camera. So with this, I thank one and all for giving, giving me this opportunity. Thank you.